All right, so um, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, Atindrio Sanyal. I'm uh, the co-founder of Galileo and uh, was previously one of the tech leads for uh, Uber's Michelangelo feature store. And uh, today I'll mainly be talking about uh, the future of a data-centric ML and in particular about um, data quality and the different data quality challenges across the ML workflow and how data quality tooling allows key components of the ML ecosystem uh, like feature stores and other systems to deliver higher value to uh, downstream consumers and models. So uh, this is kind of preaching to the choir, but uh, machine learning is driving powerful decisions across a gamut of businesses and is increasing at a rapid pace year over year. Uh, the number of ML engineers is also growing at a rate of 70 plus percent each year, uh, which is similar to the pattern we saw in the rise of application developers in the earlier part of the last decade. Um, so it's very early going for ML right now, and it's already being used in critical businesses uh, and making critical business decisions across different industries. So the last few years, uh, we've seen the commoditization of models and the ease of availability of pre-trained models trained on organized data sets of curated text and images um, you know, being available off the shelf. And this has led to the rise of techniques like transfer learning and um, you know, systems like Hugging Face paving the way for this kind of commoditization. And uh, the last few years have also, of course, seen the standardization of hyperparameter tuning. And this essentially has reduced model development to practically a few lines of code. And on top of this, uh, ML infrastructure has matured immensely uh, with the advent of systems like feature stores and also newer ideas around embedding stores, which my good friend Laurel will be speaking about later. Uh, essentially running complex ML workflows at scale has become automated and a lot easier than it was maybe half a decade ago. Also with the um, advent of frameworks like Horoward and Ray, even running deep learning at scale has sort of seen the light of day today. Now with the standardization, the focus has now shifted on the data, which has kind of become the lifeblood of MN models. Um, and building a well-trained model on high quality data leads to better predictions and better business outcomes. And to that extent, bad quality data, even on a well-trained model leads to poor predictions, which in turn affects your business. Uh, the problem of data quality is very real. And of course it is across structured as well as unstructured data. Uh, although the problem is 10x amplified when you're dealing with unstructured data like text, images, audio, which is primarily about 80% of the world's data. Now, companies are generating humongous amounts of data uh, that, you know, to the extent that data lakes have essentially become landfills. And from heaps of data, you know, extracting features that are relevant to uh, a model is a very difficult task. And whenever you find relevant features, all the, the relevant data to train your model on, uh, more often than not, it is laden with noise, it is badly labeled, it's essentially of low quality. And there, there's way too many examples to cite, but if you look at FinTech, healthcare, retail companies, or even high-tech firms that have a very high production ML footprint, like feature engineering kind of suffers from low quality data seeping into ML pipelines far too often. On top of that, data scientists typically have a habit of throwing the kitchen sink of features to the model without a systematic approach towards pruning the right and relevant features. And this combined with the lack of observability uh, sort of often leads to what we call model downtimes, which essentially refers to regressed model behavior and bad quality predictions. So just wanna take a step back and look at the different high level phases of the model lifecycle. Uh, it essentially starts with feature discovery and feature preparation, uh, which in turn leads to a data set of features and labels, which are ready to be fit to a model. And uh, once we have a ready data set, we train and evaluate our model, uh, which is typically an iterative process of looking at the model performance on a test data set. And once we have our goal metric, which is typically either an F1 score or an objective function, you uh, kind of deploy your model to production where it meets uh, data from the real world and make pre makes predictions on it. 
So the data quality problem starts at the very onset with uh, the first phase of feature engineering, where the goal is to curate an ideal data set for your model. Uh, the definition of an ideal data set is essentially uh, the most diverse and representative data uh, or features that can give your model an optimum performance. Typically, this is an iterative process, but the goal is to figure out the minimal set of data that you want to train your model on. Uh, in the structured data world of numeric and categorical features, the ideal data set represents the features most apt for your model and your use case. Uh, feature stores usually have a metadata layer which can serve as a gold mine of feature usage information that can be leveraged to suggest most relevant features for your uh, model and your use case. Uh, and on top of this, there's uh, information theory metrics such as entropy and label relevance, which I'll touch upon. Uh, uh, you know, metrics that are purely data centric and can surface information about the training data set uh, and it can help curate a minimal data set for your model. In the world of unstructured data, curating that ideal data set, of course, involves figuring out the most representative and diverse data. Uh, and there's different data centric techniques, again, uh, many of them leveraging embeddings uh, that can give you uh, this data, uh, taking other important factors like class imbalance and other anomalies into account. Now, when we train your our models, uh, trusting the data set that you trained on is a key part of high quality uh, model building process. Uh, trusting your data set essentially means uh, identifying the vulnerabilities in the data set and issues that are hidden in different corners of your data set investigating model metrics like F1 scores and confusion matrices is indeed necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, it's important to look at the data from the lens of the model. And um, you know, that includes identifying different regions of model underperformance, evaluating robustness across different subpopulations of your data set, spotting label anomalies, identifying similar examples to these anomalies, and finally fixing the noisy data and the ground truth errors. The evaluation phase, phase of, of the model building, of course, faces similar challenges about on the test or the validation data set. There's a gold mine of data that the model emanates when uh, we train, uh, run our training and validation data sets through them. And uh, this data can be leveraged in identifying these vulnerabilities. And finally, when you deploy your model to production, um, the world changes, the features drift, um, anomalous data is encountered. Uh, so it's critical to identify this drift, compare, you know, compare it to the feature distributions of your training data set, uh, correlate model drift to importance, uh, and, and do this in real time. And, and detecting these issues is one part of the problem, but really tying it back to uh, the, the training data set sort of completes the ML flywheel. So just summarizing the gamut of data quality issues and challenges which are faced across the ML workflow here. Um, I want to briefly speak about one of the first key challenges we face when we train our models, um, curating the most representative data, uh, which is part of the pre-training workflow. And the challenge is in doing uh, essentially data annotation budgeting and active learning plays a key role in this. Um, leveraging embeddings from the pre-trained layers of your model uh, can help identify sparse regions in your data set and help pick a diverse data set that's ideal for your model. Uh, there's established techniques in literature, which I've pointed to here in slides, uh, that help in extracting data that's high value for the model. But many of them uh, are NP hard uh, in, in complexity and they go much beyond polynomial time and they don't scale. So um, uh, the, the, the trick is to combine uh, approximation techniques with these techniques uh, to sort of help reduce the complexity of these algorithms. Uh, to polynomial time complexity. Uh, another technique that's effective in um, uh, depending on the data distribution, of course, is looking at uncertainty in models and uh, helping pick data around your decision boundaries. Uh, this combined with clustering can lead to selection of high value data sets uh, and get a developer to an optimal model performance with minimal data. For numeric and categorical features, uh, measuring redundancy as well as label relevance via mutual information uh, can help uh, filter out data uh, with similar correlation to labels and, and other features. 
uh, and not add it, uh, and detect features which don't add much value to the models, uh, thereby not only saving resource and compute, but also helping build powerful models with minimal data. Uh, uh, some of these techniques, particularly around um, um, uh, structured data, uh, was built by, by folks from my team uh, at Uber, and I've sort of pointed to a blog they recently published about it. Uh, the second challenge is uh, identifying uh, noisy data. Uh, and this identification is done using various pruning processes, um, helping build clean models on clean data. And uh, there are statistical techniques uh, that help segregate noisy data from good data uh, that can include looking at confidence margins as well as confidence correlations to the uncertainty in the models uh, across different features. And, and these help identify regions of model underperformance and help figure out what data to augment uh, to our data set that can lead to performance improvements in training as well as evaluation. And beyond looking at uncertainty at the level of a feature vector, um, inspecting joint distributions between noisy labels and clean labels, along with observing you know, fractions of observed samples that are misclassified in other classes, can also help detect uh, errors in the ground truth labels. Um, uh, on top of this, uh, one can also leverage SHAP values, uh, which is a game theory concept, and that can sort of tell you uh, the, the contribution of features uh, you know, to a particular prediction. Um, and, and a lot of these techniques, uh, uh, including the ones I described above, uh, are data independent in nature. Uh, so they can be applied to text data, image data, as well as numerical and categorical data. Uh, many of the techniques that I you know, described previously are in service of identifying data set vulnerabilities, that is regions of uh, uh, model underperformance, detecting confusion across labels, uh, noise, uh, segregating data that's simple for the model from the noise, and, and tackling other vulnerabilities include uh, detecting subpopulations of interest, uh, as well as clustering anomalous uh, data points using similarity measures and nearest neighbor methodologies. Um, and overall, optimizing on developer time by providing systematic tooling for automating the detection of these issues in service of evaluating the models. Um, uh, integrating it with uh, different parts of the ML toolscape, including feature stores, labeling platforms, as well as um, deployment services that serve models to really sort of tie it all together and gauge the data quality of models across the entire workflow. Uh, and last but not least, uh, when our models get deployed to production, uh, adapting the model to uh, data changing over time ensures models are continuously making good predictions. Uh, when we deploy the model to a production environment, uh, the world changes and the features drift and you encounter anomalous data. So it's not only critical to identify these issues in feature distributions, but uh, also monitor uh, the key metrics across different subpopulations of your interest. Uh, to take an example from my previous experiences at Siri, at Apple, uh, 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 say uh, so the different um, text utterances would be classified into domains and say the 911 domain is a particular subpopulation of interest. Uh, so it's important to measure uh, and monitor these subpopulations of interest and really tie it back to the training ecosystem uh, where you can leverage you know, this data quality information for auto retraining by either augmenting your data sets with uh, synthetic data, which is built from these signals and data, uh, data quality metrics that you capture uh, or with identifying missing sparse features, uh, as well as extracting new features from alternative knowledge bases, uh, feature stores, of course, as well as embeddings from pre-trained models. Uh, and this can lead to you know, high end-to-end, -end, uh, high quality models that run continuously uh, in your ecosystem. Uh, yeah, that's about it. It was a short, presentation, but um, I would love to sort of take questions uh, if you have any.